RadioNext.tv on the Cool Group site. We are back. Warp and Wolf Radio, the Comenius Institute, sponsors this great show. And uh, where Christian and wisdom and life connect is the motto here at Comenius. And Dr. Mark Echo, who is the man <laughs> <laughs> over at Comenius Institute here locally. And Mark, please, before we get into today's show, uh, explain a little bit more about Comenius Institute and, and what you guys are doing. Yeah, absolutely. So Comenius is a bridge between high school and college for young people who are moving into a uh, setting that's a public setting, uh, maintaining their Christian faith while they're there. I've even got some st- stories fresh off the grill, actually, from this <laughs> week uh, about the kinds of information and, and connections that we were making and questions we were answering. So we're really excited about what we're doing down at IUPUI and really glad to be able to serve the students. And a brand new school year, so I know each year brings a whole new element, a whole new Absolutely. fabric uh, when, when you bring those students in. That's right. Um, you know, today's show is, is very relevant uh, because we're talking about Christian worldview. And with internet accessibility, we were kind of talking about this before we went on air about the difference in how you do exactly right. due to the tools of yes. technology today. Uh, but please describe for the audience uh, what the word worldview means and uh, give a few examples. If sure. You I think the best metaphor actually is looking through glasses, through lenses. So you and I are both looking through lenses right now. I don't know if that says anything about our age, but nonetheless, there it is. <laughs> As some people say, uh, things like, you're looking through rose-colored glasses. Folks make those kinds of statements. And what they mean is, you see the world in a certain way. So we use the word viewpoint all the time. So what we say, what's your view on whatever, fill in the blank. Now, NPR does this all the time. They ask questions, and we do this on this show. You ask me questions, and then we ask questions of our guests. And what we're saying is, what's your view so when we say world view, all we mean is what our view, what is your view of the world? So there's all kinds of glasses out there. There's all kinds of lenses that people look through. How you see the world is going to be different than how I see the world. You have different experiences, education, parents and friends. You live in a different place, you come from a different neighborhood, from different influences. All those things make up our lenses, our glasses and how we see the world. And since this is a Christian program, our first thought is, how will I see my world differently as a Christian? So where does a Christian view come from? It always comes from Scripture, from the Bible. If we're Christians, our primary source of knowledge and information that informs how we view the world should come from God's Word. Real simple. Yeah. Uh, Or should be. It should Uh, be. Because the map map is there, and a lot of times what I find that we do as people is uh, once distracted or once in despair, yeah. We, we tend to want to leave that map That's right. and start figuring it out for ourselves, right. uh, which is not the way to do it. Uh, we always come from Proverbs on this show, right. uh, which is, you know, <laughs> how to love your neighbor, how to <laughs> honor your parents, all the rules all those things. of the game. But how does Proverbs 2, 1 through 15 set the stage uh, for thinking about the world from God's perspective? So let me read a few of these verses here from Proverbs chapter 2. It begins, My son, if you receive my words... And treasure up my commands with you. And I'm going to fast forward all the way down to the end. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Now, there's so much that we could say about all these things, as as I say this every single week. uh, So much to say about all these verses. But what's interesting here to me is that the word if is repeated three times in these first few verses. And it's actually assumed eight different times. So the question or the statement is, if you receive my words... So it literally is up to the person. There's no coercion. There's no arm twisting. If It's there if you want it. But guess what? Humility is the key. We have to begin by saying, I don't know. We begin with a posture of submission, bowing to the knowledge of somebody else, namely the one who gave us all knowledge. And it starts with humility, but it moves to value. So it, the proverb says, if you receive this, then you will treasure it. So the worldview thinking begins with humility and then moves to importance. And the question is, what's important to you? If you think biblical wisdom is essential to life, then you think God's word has significance about how you live. And then you value what you pursue. If you think my car, my house, my job, my money, my marriage, my hobby is most important, then it's what's going to have an impact on my view of the world. But Proverbs doesn't stop there. It's not just knowing. It's not just living a certain way. It's about our being. Listen to chapter 2 and verse 10. For wisdom will come into your heart. Now that phrase literally means in the Hebrew, entering a house. It means all your mind, your emotion, will, choices, conduct, appetites, desires, passions, everything. Your view of the world will come 
from where you live, the house you've built, how you look out the windows of that house into the rest of the world. So our view of the world begins with humility, it moves to what's important, and then it enters our mindset and our whole person. So your mental culture is weak. Hey, look at you, man. Hey. Look at you. Hey, a I'm theologian. Just, I'm just a guy listening. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, but you know, and, and, and we've been speaking on a lot of this. What's so amazing is sometimes we come together. We, mm-hmm. we talked off air, and then when we get on the air, we started the dialogue. Yeah. And we were just talking about the world being flat now, technology, yeah. um, right. which has changed the church as well. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, why is worldview teaching so important for Christians everywhere? And then. How do you see the church today? Yeah, man, this is this is a big deal. We're going to be talking about it all the way through this program. Four years in a row now, each fall, my pastors have asked me to teach adult Bible courses on Sunday morning. So I've taught 12 weeks each fall on these topics, movies, work, suffering, and this year on wisdom. Every single Sunday, people are asking three simple questions when you go to church. So what? Who cares? And why should I listen to you today? So I want to say that those four falls that I spoke on movies, work, suffering, and wisdom, every single time folks coming in my class are asking those things, so what, who cares, why should I listen to you? Let me give you three quick examples. They all start with E so we can remember them. The first one's ethnicity. How do we treat, view, or listen to people different from ourselves? Bible's clear. Treat others how you want to be treated. The second one is ethics. Why shouldn't I enslave people? Why shouldn't I cut corners on the job at work? Why should I be honest, responsible, or caring? Ethics. How about economics? What's the best way for people to make, use, or spend their money? Are there certain systems of commerce that work better than others? How do I help the disadvantaged, destitute, downtrodden of our culture? Worldview teaching should be important to the church since people, its people function, the church's people function in a world which they view in a certain way. So people are bringing their views into the church, and the church has a responsibility to either augment those views, uh, critique those views, or say, yeah, man, encourage that view, because that's, that's what we want to see in the church. And that's what we need to be as a church, and sometimes we fall so short. Um, we're going to come back in the second segment. We're going to dive into uh, some more detail about worldview and uh, what you need to know. You are listening to Warp and Wolf Radio on the Cool Groove site at Radio Network Radio Next TV on the Cool Group site. Warp and Wolf Radio, Comenius Institute brings you this show each and every Wednesday morning, 10 a.m. to 12 o'clock p.m. Dr. Mark Eckel, Harold H. B. Bell in here, and uh, just trying to provide you with some wisdom and knowledge as it comes from Proverbs. And if you don't know, Warp and Wolf means what, Dr. Mark? Warp and Woo for the vertical horizontal threads that make fabric. And that fabric is the wholeness, the coherence of uh, all things under the Lordship of Christ, Colossians 1.17, by him are all things held together. Before we get into this second segment, yeah. uh, are you the needle or the thread? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> you sent that out this morning. I laughed out loud yeah, when I saw you know, that. You know, because we're stitching it up. <laughs> uh, but we're talking today about Christian worldview. Um, and it's so important today as we, you know, have to, uh, we, we were talking about the mental culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have to open our minds up a little deeper. This world is not uh, th- this little continent here, city here. I mean, this right. world is, is woven together now right. through uh, the new tools of technology. So we have to embrace everyone and we need to anyway. Uh, but you've been teaching for 30 years. And how is the worldview thinking? impacted your teaching sure so i would say that there are three baseline comments here about worldview basically everybody believes something that's number one the second one is that something that something is going to impact how you think if you believe it it's going to impact you and the third one is what somebody thinks will impact how they live so you believe something it's going to impact you it's going to impact how you live those basic ideas drive my teaching now there are the basic concepts of education for me that I kind of abide by are these. I teach students tools of learning, and then I teach students questions so they discover their own learning. Here's an example of this. I'm sitting at dinner with a couple of former students I was visiting out in Denver this past year, and I said to them, you know, these are, these are folks who have their own kids now, they're grown, they're in their 30s, and uh, I said, how has the worldview teaching that you received in school impacted you into this uh, present time? And they kind of looked at each other and shook their head, and one of them said, I don't know if I can tell you about one thing. This person said, it impacts everything. 
So the whole concept of how you live life, if that wisdom has entered your house, remember what Proverbs 2 says there, uh, this is really important. So it impacts everything that we do. I was asked to write an article some time ago uh, that addressed this very question, and the, the question is, after 30 years, how have you now see, how do you now see your students? And I could tell you story after story after story. I could tell you about Taylor, who now cuts records down in Nashville. He's got a national presence. He's an amazing artist. I could tell you about KC, who lives out in uh, New Mexico. She got her full-ride scholarship, PhD in art history from University of Chicago. Uh, she blazed new trails there. Nathan is a great business person, lives out in Arizona, uh, Great does great things for the Lord there. And Katie, I could talk about Katie and her impact in visual arts, how she teaches her students how to th view the world differently because they're Christians. So I'm looking at all these different kinds of students, and I'm asking this question, how has worldview impacted their thinking? Uh, well, I think it came through me first because it impacted my teaching and my thinking first. So it always impacts the teacher first. If it doesn't impact you, it ain't going nowhere. <laughs> let, let me ask you this, uh, because you've given me some great examples. Um, how has your lens been adjusted over the last 30 years in your, in your teaching practices? Shoot, man. <laughs> that's, I mean, really. It's huge. Yeah. I, that's a great question. My lens has been adjusted so many times it's not funny. Uh, so I come out of grad school. And, you know, what do I know? I, I'm going into a setting where I'm teaching junior to senior high school students. I've not had one education course in my lifetime. And I'm going in there trying to teach kids after I come out of this full grad school component. And I had no clue how to test. I had no clue how to assess. I had no clue about classroom management. None of that stuff. And I was literally learning on the fly in a way that was very, very beneficial, but, you know, not to some of those earlier students who had to put up with me. So I would say that it's a constant renewal. And uh, even now, you know, I'm teaching classes now and I'm thinking, you know, that didn't work so well today. I'll just try it a different way next time. Well, well speaking of now, how do you how do you teach um, people who are born and bred in the culture of the city of Indianapolis, the yeah. worldview principles? Yeah. So a uh, bottom line, I think, is uh, always going to be the same for me. Uh, and that is that I'm concerned about the practice of how do we think differently uh, as people. Uh, let me give you some examples of this. And I, I think these things could apply in Indianapolis. They could apply pretty much anywhere. Uh, I'll give you, tell you some stories about things I've done in the past. So f one of the things I did when I was teaching, and this was early on, was I invited DJs from local radio stations into my classroom. You would have loved this, man. I bet I would. <laughs> so I'm, I've got these guys in there, and here's the question of the day. How does radio how does music impact sexuality in teenagers <laughs> oh, oh, oh. you don't want to start a max you, you should see hb's face right now wow. <laughs> no this is huge and and the djs they all said to me man if school was like this when i was going to school i would have loved it well the kids came up with all the questions because they're singing all the songs right so they know all this stuff and they're the ones who are generating the questions because it's obvious that the kinds of music are going to impact how they think about sex. And that really did uh, make a huge impact and impression on them. I've had pa uh, panel discussions with doctors where we've discussed things like in vitro fertilization, assisted suicide, quality of life versus sanctity of life. And these are people from the community. So I'm thinking Indianapolis, if I'm going to be a teacher in a setting like this again, I'm thinking I'm going to go grab some t doctors around town and set them in front of my kids. Let's have a conversation with those folks. I could tell you about uh, building environments in a shoebox. You're going to love this. So uh, juniors in high school, I had them all bring in shoeboxes. And they were working partners. And they were supposed to identify uh, Genesis 2.15. You're supposed to provide for and protect whatever it is that God's given to you. So they created these environments. And then these uh, students had to say, how are they going to protect what they've been given? And then how are they going to defend it? you know, once, once somebody wants to take it over. I mean, basically what we're doing is we're getting ready for life. doesn't matter what it is. And I could go on and on and on at HB and tell you so many different ideas. Ultimately, to me as a teacher, it all comes back to project-based learning. I'm very big into getting students to discover on their own. Developing what if. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Interesting, you know, yeah. and and I do that all the time with my youth and my programming. I yes, always you do. ask the question, "What if?" 
That's um, right. And if we want to develop layers of thinking, we have to ask questions that are going to stimulate That's right. that frontal lobe. Isn't That's right. right. That's exactly <laughs> right. We've got one more segment in this first hour. This is really good stuff. And I hope the listeners are out here understanding um, that, that we're talking about Christian worldview because uh, the world now is so small and so compact. And we have to deal with one another's cultures and differences if we want to make this work perfectly. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to come back in the third segment and talking about how they get the community engaged. And then at the top of the hour, we're going to have Professor Jose Baxter, Baxter talking about uh, Christian worldview. You are listening to Warp and Wolf Radio on Radio Next.tv and the Cool Group side. Radio Next.tv on the Cool Group side. Yeah, Tracy, how you doing out there at 3M? I was just talking about you. And thank you for listening in, you and the 3M crew out there. Uh, we are back, Warp and Wolf Radio, Comenius Institute, bringing you each and every Wednesday, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., Christian viewpoints based off of the biblical theories of Proverbs. That's so, right. You know, that's, that's what right. we do each and every Wednesday, Dr. Mark Echo, Harold H.B. Bell. And we're in the third segment of the show today. Uh, before I guess, uh, Professor Jose Baxter comes in to talk about Christian worldview. Um, Mark, community engagement yep. in the world. Uh, you've written books and movies and, and books on movies. Yep. Tell us about how you have taught world through, uh, view through film and kind of like the importance of how to use film. Sure, absolutely. So since the late 1980s, I've taught students how to watch movies through a Christian lens. Uh, actually, when I was in classes uh, in the late 80s all the way through the 90s, I was teaching students how to write movie reviews. We would watch full-length feature films. Uh, while we were watching or while we were in class. So when I taught about God's sovereignty, for instance, that sovereignty simply means that God's in charge of everything, uh, we would watch the movie Mosquito Coast with Harrison Ford, who played a scientist who thought he was in charge of everything. So we watched that whole movie. We taught them how to write the movie review and so on. Students understood that we have a choice. Either God exists, who personally uh, plans and oversees all things, or we humans by ourselves are in charge. Just before Jurassic Park came out, back in the 90s, I was reading sections of Michael Crichton's book to the class, and of course the key point that he was driving home is, the question is not can we do something, but should we do something? And then I took 25 students to the opening of the movie, and they came with me, and they learned all that the media addresses through worldview questions. So in all of these classes that I was teaching all the time, I was constantly using film clips, three to five minute uh, sections of movies, uh, using them in classes to create discussion about what movies were teaching. So for example, uh, we watched a movie called Extreme Measures uh, with Gene Hackman playing kind of a mad scientist who was literally killing people in order to find a a cure for cancer. And his great question in the movie is, if we had to kill somebody to find the cure for cancer, wouldn't we have to do that? Well, there's the ethics, you know, that's the whole issue of ethics. So I'm, I was constantly using film clips uh, to, to talk about some of those things. I was probably the most famous, however, for taking my notebook to the movie theater. So I would go to the movies, and I had this little pen that, that you know, the tip lit up and stuff so I could see what I was writing. And inevitably, students would come in, and they'd sit behind me, somewhere behind me, and about halfway, three quarters of the way through a movie, you know, I'd take out the notebook and I'd start writing stuff in my notebook. And I would always hear the same thing from X number of seats behind me, students whispering really loud, look, he's taken out the notebook. <laughs> I'll never forget that. So my responsibility is I bear the responsibility to teach young people how to think as Christians. Movies is just my thing. Other people do other things. You do your thing on the radio. My job, I think, is to help them understand the visual communication through film. And and, then that leads us to this next question, uh, which is a great segue. Um, What groups, because we know committees are doing some great things to to bridge the gap, Uh, give me some groups that are teaching about worldview and uh, give some examples of what they might do. Man, I'll tell you, when I started back teaching in 1983, there were very few people, groups, or churches that were talking about Christian worldview. And now everybody talks about it. Everybody. So I mentioned uh, a story some time back, I think, when I was working with Chuck Colson back in the 90s, uh, when I was uh, actually going to speak for his group, Wilberforce uh, Forum. I spoke at the uh, intelligent design conference with him back in 2004. I worked with Prison Fellowship. I wrote curriculum with him and so on. And all of that stuff 
uh, was driven by this emphasis on worldview teaching. So all of those kinds of things are now just kind of second nature to people. You've got folks like uh, John Stone Street uh, and then Eric Metaxas, and these guys kind of take have taken over since Colson has died, and his online presence and the five-minute radio program they do every week. So they're just all about this. Radio Christi is a group, actually have one here in IUPUI's campus, of college uh, campus groups around the United States, and they provide apologetic worldview training for students. Christian universities, uh, places like Biola and Houston Baptist down in Houston and Union University down in Tennessee. These are great universities that are doing great work in terms of Christian worldview. Uh, John Jay Institute, the Trinity Forum, Acton Institute. Uh, just this uh, morning I was listening uh, uh, to a tweet sent by my brother Neil Cox here in Indianapolis about how to use media to impact worldview. And I, told, I tweeted him back and said I would love to have a conference on media in Indianapolis. Wouldn't that be cool? So there's all kinds of things here. And now presently, uh, beyond Cominius, I'm still uh, teaching and I teach at the Master's Study. I teach world literature. I teach Gothic horror literature. And uh, soon, in September, we're going to start something with Apprentice University where I'll be teaching strictly on worldview on Friday morning. So, man, we're all over the place doing this thing. A couple of questions before we get to the last. Sure, yeah. You know, I, I listen. <laughs> a preacher doing Gothic horror. <laughs> <laughs> Explain that. <laughs> and then, sure. And then, how is the traditional church um, <laughs> a- accepting uh, groups like Comenius Acton and some yeah. of the others that you named? Because I'm sure this is rubbing oh, uh, yeah. their traditional teachings. In a different way. <laughs> a different yeah, way absolutely. Yeah. So first to the Gothic question. So Gothic horror, uh, when we talk about this, in fact, I had, I had a conversation with, with some older folks just the other day, I mean, a couple nights ago. And uh, they kind of, you know, look at me really weird when I mention this stuff. And I said, if you think about it this way, that they're simply morality tales. That's all they're doing is they're teaching ethics. Frankenstein, Jekyll Hyde, these are ethical books. And Christians ought to be reading these books. Uh, how are churches responding to this? Uh, My church, for instance, uh, just signed us up, the Cominius Institute, uh, to support us uh, for this next year. Awesome. Uh, So it's really great. I spoke at the missions conference up there. And any churches out there, any folks that are connected to churches that would like me to come and speak for their groups or speak for a missions conference or even add us to their missions budget, you know, (laughs) as a nonprofit, there you go. There's a little plug. I will be happy to come and and speak and teach uh, for folks. Uh, But... You know, honestly, uh, the last question here for this segment is the most important one. Yeah. So when we talk about uh, the issue of worldview, uh, I've got to talk about these folks, these IUPUI students that I'm dealing with right now, and their interaction with the worldview questions. So here's a couple of stories. So Monday, I'm sitting with a bunch of kids uh, on Kavanaugh 3. And that's one of the teaching uh, venues over at IUPUI. And there's about five of us sitting there, and we have this conversation, just talking about life. We're talking about uh, the things that we're learning and so on. And one of the students said, well, I've been wanting to ask you this question. I knew I was going to see you. Uh, One of the questions that came up in one of my classes was, why are human beings always at war? Why are human beings always at war? And, And so I said, well, did the professor give you any framework for this that is did they give you any standards whereby did they give you any standards whereby you uh, were were giving a righteous uh, framework within which to think about these issues of war and they said well no uh, they said well you, you know you just have to be at peace with it with people and I said well where does peace come from did the, did the professor talk about that and they said well no 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 answer was really given to that and so I said Let me tell you about the two basic doctrines that everybody needs to understand as Christians. Absolute truth and the inherent corruption of humanity. I said, if if we know that war is wrong, the only way we know that is if there's an outside source that's told us war is wrong and killing is wrong, because otherwise we would just keep killing each other with everybody just left up to themselves to do whatever they wanted. But the second issue is this, that the problem really with warfare is the problem with me because I'm corrupt. I feel within myself my desire to usurp and control. And when somebody doesn't agree with me, I, you know, you feel that thing about, you know, just 
you want to get rid of this person because you don't want that person, you don't want that other voice around. I was just listening to NPR on the way over here and the awfulness of things that are going on in places like Uzbekistan where they just kill people for disagreeing with them. I mean, my word, come on. But we live in the United States of America. So here we are, we're answering these kinds of questions for young people. And then just yesterday, here's another story. I got to share this story with you. I'm sitting with a, with a young man just coming out of high school into his freshman year, and he is all about joining the Marine Corps. And I mean, this guy is already hard and fast. He's right there. He's ready to go. Brilliant young mind. And we, we were talking about spiritual gifts. So I said to him, so what's your gift? And he said, well, you know, I like to do this. I like to do that. I said, well, it, it sure sounds like you've been given the gift of having a warrior spirit. I mean, you just... You, you love this stuff. You, you want to go out and defend and protect. And he said, I've never heard anybody say that to me before. Nobody's ever, nobody's ever acknowledged the fact that going into the Marine Corps is a gift. I said, man, you're a gift to me because you're defending me. You're the one standing between me and the bad guys out there. So I love the Corps, and I love the fact that you've been given this passion, obviously desire from God to do what you're going to be doing. You want to defend your country. You want to protect the innocent. You want to stop the bad guys in their tracks. This this is a God-given gift. So here it is, HB. At the, at the end of the day, at, at the end of this segment, let me just say this. The Christian worldview impacts everything. How we think about life is developed by what knowledge and what wisdom we take in. Remember we said about Proverbs and Proverbs 2, you let this wisdom enter in. It's like coming into your house. But beyond that, young people need to see the bridge between what they think and how they live. And it all starts with inside, inside of themselves, and they need to be given good answers to the questions like my students at Cominius are asking and the campus of IUPUI. Phenomenal. The minds of the young people are so in-depth these That's days. Right. All we have to do is continue to fill it with proper knowledge. Uh, Brother Jose Baxter's in the house, and we're going to be talking to him uh, about the worldview of a Christian. Uh, when we come back at the top of the hour, you are listening to the Cominius Institute. Warp and Wolf Radio, Radio Next TV on the Cool Group side. Radio Next TV on the Cool Group site. You are listening to Warp and Wolf Radio, sponsored by Comenius Institute, Dr. Mark Echo, Harold H. B. Bell, and in studio right now we have our special guest today, Professor Jose Baxter, and welcoming him into the Radio Next TV studio, Mark. Take it away. All buddy. right. Well, just before we start, we'll give a little bit of background again on the worldview issue just to make sure everybody's st still with us here in the second hour. Uh, when we talk about worldview, it's how what lenses you look through, what uh, glasses you're putting on to see your world. Uh, we talk about people having certain viewpoints all the time. Everybody has a viewpoint because they have a certain view of the world. And that view literally lives in us. Uh, Proverbs 2 tells us that it's in our house. It comes into us. And so it comes from the inside out, and that's how that works. So uh, we're just thrilled to have Professor Jose Baxter with us today. Uh, Professor Baxter and I worked uh, for four years at Crossroads Bible College, and we're just thrilled to have you here on the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, your church, life experiences, and what kind of work you do in Indianapolis. Well, I'll, I'll try to be brief, Doctor. Oh, Baxter. please, don't be brief. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, like so many individuals, I grew up in a rather conservative Christian home, but uh, the primary focus was that you believed and not necessarily why you believed. Mm. And so uh, as, as I grew up, that continued to uh, make me vulnerable, uh, not only in relationship to unbelievers, but uh, as I started coming in contact with individuals who identified themselves as believers but saw the world very differently from what I had been teach, uh, I had been taught. And um, so I grew up in that matrix, struggling, uh, you know, confused uh, when I would come across someone who, uh, say, uh, was coming from a worldview that was more, more consistent with uh, an apostolic worldview or a Mormonist worldview or a Seventh-day Adventist and you know you're trying to reconcile your understanding of the word in relationship to their understanding of the word and and uh, and the idea that we were all supposedly seeing the world the way it truly is mm -hmm. but seeing it very differently in certain aspects and of course 
I took that confusion uh, also into my marriage, unfortunately, and, uh, and, you know, just continue to raise my children under that same motif, you know, this is what we believe, mm-hmm. uh, even uh, without explaining to them why did we believe these things. Mm. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, I went to college uh, that uh, my worldview began to be deconstructed again. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, a fairly liberal uh, institution. And so here uh, I was given the facts of um, why my worldview are supposedly the facts as to why my worldview, my understanding of the Bible was inconsistent with reality. And when you're being baptized in that kind of environment, uh, your worldview and ultimately the way you function in light of your understanding of that worldview uh, begins to fall apart. So this would also have a negative impact on my children. Uh, To some extent, uh, my marriage. Uh, But it wasn't until I met a a, a young man, and I refer to everybody as young man. Uh, His name was Dr. Robert Adair, and he, he passed away several months ago. But he was an individual, uh, one of the very few Renaissance men Mm. that I've ever met in my life. And fortunately for me, he was steeped in uh, the biblical tradition. Mm. Uh, He he was very much rooted in a Christian worldview. And by God's grace, I ran into him by happenstance at at a bookstore. Mm. And we developed a relationship. I began to go to um, probably one of the most serious Sunday school uh, engagements uh, in in my life where Dr. Adair and there were several other uh, very highly educated uh, individuals who were part of this um, Bible study and they began to talk to me about logic and and you know seeing reality as it truly is and the objective nature of uh, the Bible uh, the assumptions and very often the false assumptions of many of my educators were um, uh, you know springing forth from uh, in order to teach me and uh, I began I think for the first time in my life Dr. Echo to develop a biblical world view uh, and uh, I was actually seeing the world Hmm. the way it is, Hmm. as opposed to it being processed through a lot of assumptions that were disconnected from reality. And from that point forward, I was not only able to continue my education, but I was able to, over the course of time, uh, begin to engage my professors Hmm. and uh, you know, politely or at least attempting to be polite in challenging some of their assumptions, challenging the applications they were making with respect to their understanding of Scripture. Uh, It created a very lively environment. And I must say, uh, because I learned to think, and I believe that's what Christian worldview is about, is teaching us how to think, not just what to think, but how to think. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was able to go and spend nearly uh, three years at CTS Mm. uh, as an evangelical Christian, very confident of my understanding of the faith, confident of my ability to, um, and of course this is uh, with the leading of the Holy Spirit, so this is not just an intellectual exercise, Mm -hmm. but uh, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, understanding the word rightly, I was able to survive and even thrive in that environment and challenge my professors and challenge uh, other students, you know, as as God opened the door to have conversations with other students, some, of course, who, uh, unfortunately, I would say was lost in the view of man Mm -hmm. and and, and a humanistic understanding of who God is and his word, but others who uh, had their light or their understanding uh, turned on and were able to continue in that environment uh, without being corrupted. And so uh, I think from that perspective, we can begin to see how critical and how important a Christian worldview or a biblical worldview is uh, to every believer. And I would also encourage our listeners 
to start at an early age, mm -hmm. uh, start as early as possible uh, to raise up our children in a Christian worldview so that they can confidently engage the world like you were doing, you know, at, 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 uh, at the Chlamydia Institute. But uh, let's try to get them at an earlier age. Let's mm -hmm. try to get them while they're, you know, five and mm -hmm. six and seven and just raise them up in this biblical worldview uh, that, again, gives them confidence about the faith, uh, helps them uh, to be discipled in time, would help them to disciple others. And I think if, if we disciple from this biblical worldview, I think our people are going to be naturally more evangelistic, mm. which could only um, help the, 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 uh, the kingdom of Christ. Mm. If we really become these biblically world-minded evangelistic individuals that God has called us to be to engage a world that is lost, corrupt, broken, indifferent, you know, and, and the mm -hmm. adjectives could go on and on and on. Mm. These are <clears throat> wonderful comments. I'm, I'm thinking about so many different things that we could uh, spin off uh, on here. Uh, one of them, let's go back to one th something very specific you mentioned about uh, getting uh, people while they're young. Uh, this was something that happened in my house. I wrote a catechism for my own children. Uh, we went through this catechism. Actually, my son did it before the whole church. Uh, that was something wow. that uh, we actually generated here uh, in our own house. House, And then, of course, Robin and I have given our lives, probably about 60 years of our lives now, to uh, the whole concept of Christian school education. So when you talk about getting them young, she's a second-grade Christian school teacher. I taught junior high, high school. But let's take this to uh, a different level and, and talk about the church specifically. Let's talk about what should the church be doing what can the church do to get their young people earlier, younger, to talk about worldview issues? Well, you know, if you'll just let me backtrack a moment, just in relationship to what you just said, it would be uh, heaven on earth if the church were so committed to a biblical worldview, uh, the why of our belief, yes. that it would be ingrained in the lives of parents and that we would do what you and your wife did. I, I mean, it's virtually unheard of. In fact, I, could, I would have to say this is the first time I've heard it, uh, of, of a parent creating a catechism oh, yes. for their children mm. in order to, uh, you know, develop them mm. in the way of the Lord. If the church could be that serious about Christian faith, mm. um, we would be uh, much further down the road in um, enabling the church to live out the mandate of the kingdom of the gospel mm -hmm. that uh, Christ talks about so often in the scriptures, uh, it would help us shift. Uh, and, you know, Dr. Echo, I, and, I, and I think this is primarily uh, the problem within the church. We so focus on the gospel as salvation, which is a right thing. It's a mm -hmm. good thing. Sure. Uh, the gospel of salvation, but we forget about the gospel or the kingdom of the gospel, which calls us out into the world. A gospel of salvation can allow us to be insular and secure either in our churches or in our homes, mm -hmm. but the gospel of the kingdom calls us outside of our churches and outside of our homes. And if we're raising up a generation of Christians who have been instructed in a biblical worldview, discipled in a biblical worldview, I think it's going to be easier to make that next step, that calling into the, uh, to the world by way of the gospel of the kingdom, and the church could have a far more dynamic impact than it's having today, um, as opposed to just centering on the gospel as salvation. And, uh, but by all means, I don't want your listeners to think, uh, that I, I'm, I'm demeaning the gospel of, of salvation, not. personal of salvation. Not. It starts there. But Christ has called us to more mm -hmm. than that. He doesn't just want to redeem individuals. He's given us a gospel that redeems the whole world. Mm -hmm. But I think the church is content on just redeeming individuals disconnected from the world yes. and a biblical worldview that is consistent with the scriptures would be a... Um, uh, would, would mend 
uh, that breach. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would just hope that the church would really get serious about a biblical worldview, connecting it with the gospel of the kingdom, and raising a generation of Christians uh, that would reflect Christ, not only in their churches and in their homes, mm -hmm. but reflect Christ in the culture. Yeah. And you're not at all excited about this. I couldn't tell. You know, you you are not passionate at all about what you're saying here. Uh, this is huge. And so you you backtrack for a minute. Let me backtrack to something you said because it's really powerful and important. Uh, you talked about uh, over the earliest part of your first comments about growing up knowing what you believed. Exactly. And then you talked about uh, the necessity of learning how you communicate that belief. But you also mentioned another word, and that's the word why. So tell me why why is important. Why gives us a defense against all the negative detractors in reality. Why answers those questions, uh, some of which you probably dealt with in the earlier hour. Uh, why are we corrupt? Why are we broken? Why are we prone to war? Uh, the why gives us an understanding of reality as it is. Mm. Uh, answering the why grounds us in the real world and it gives us answers uh, to the things that we see going on around us. Uh, the why protects us from the brokenness uh, mm. in reality, the brokenness in individuals, even those individuals that would lead us astray by accident. Mm -hmm. When we know the why, we can correct and steer others mm -hmm. uh, in relationship to the truth. The why ties us directly back to the truth. <laughs> and the truth as God has um, weaved into our reality. So uh, this why helps us see the world as God sees the world, as he has made the world. And why gives us a ready defense against every detractor from any venue mm. that they would want to approach, whether it was social, mm. political, sexual, uh, familial, uh, on and on and on, on and on. 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 H.P., we have got to get the stream going up here, the live video stream, because, <laughs> you know, people are missing all of the great hand gestures going on with Hosea Baxter <laughs> right now. Uh, you hear the passion in this man's voice, but we got to get some video up in here. Uh, we've reached the end of our first segment, H.B. Unbelievable. Uh, and, and the word is being spoken, truthfully. Uh, he asked why, and I always ask my young people what if. Same question. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> We are back, RadioNext.tv at the Cool Groove site. This is Warp and Roof Radio, Harold H.B. Bell, Dr. Mark Echo. We are here every single week, 10 to 12 noon, and that's on a Wednesday. And we are excited to bring you principles from Proverbs that relate to all things in life. Today we are talking about the general concept of worldview. Specifically, because we're Christians, we're dealing with a Christian worldview. And we are privileged to have a friend of mine, Dr. Hosea Baxter, I'm going to just call you doctor because you know so much, man. Uh, Hosea Baxter, Professor Hosea Baxter, uh, we're just thrilled to have you here at the show. And let's go back to uh, just a general uh, question to kind of catch people up, and we'll see where this goes from here. Uh, when you think about the Christian worldview, how would you generally describe it for everybody? I would describe a Christian worldview as the means uh, by which we understand reality. Uh, as we work through our Christian worldview, we are striving to see the world as God sees the world. Uh, and we process everything that, tra uh, that transpires through the lens of the Bible. Uh, and this aid aids us in not only seeing the world rightly, but acting. And I think that's a very important aspect of the Christian worldview, that it isn't just an intellectual ascent uh, to... Uh, reality as God has created it, but it is lived out so that people can see that uh, God makes a very distinct difference in our lives. Mm. I'm just a bobblehead doll over here, man. I'm just shaking my head up and down, up and down. That's why we got to have this video streaming coming in here because uh, it's really interesting to see uh, the facial expressions and, of course, uh, uh, all of the kinds of hand gestures that anybody would give. But 
Uh, let's take that a step further. We, you were talking about the issue of lenses. We talked about that early on in the first hour, how everybody has a view of the world, so we talked about glasses. John Calvin was famous for that, actually giving us that metaphor of, of looking through uh, the lens or the glasses, uh, the structure of glasses uh, through Scripture. Uh, but let's go back to what you just said. It's, you said it's not simply an intellectual assent, but it's also behavior. What links the two of those things together, the intellect and then the behavior? How do those two things come together in the human being? I, I think behavior uh, exemplifies true belief. Hmm. Uh, if I believe something, then I act on it. Uh, and I think that is evidence to me, I think it's evidence to God, and it's evidence to the world that I have submitted mm. to this biblical world view. Uh, and uh, I, I think that this, I, I think, is, is one of the uh, primary charges that the world may bring against the church. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think sometimes we're very often guilty of yes. those charges that we say one thing. Yes. Uh, but when we are living it out, uh, we are living in quite a different way. So I, I think that's where the, the tie in as it relates to the evidence of mm. do I truly believe this? Uh, and, and again, I think that evidence is manifested in the fact that it is lived out. Yes. And so when we talk about this belief situation, we're talking about something you can't see. Absolutely. So this is something that's developed within the individual person. Sure. Developed through their will, uh, through their intellect, through their choices, uh, through their passions, desires, yearnings, all of those kinds of things. Absolutely. So how do we train? How do we how do we teach uh, people uh, about through all of those avenues that that we can't see or touch or feel? We can talk about intellect. We can talk about the cognitive emphasis. We can talk about activity and behavior. But how do we talk about those things that we can't see? How do we get after that? Well, I, I think people process uh, that unseen world, and this is going to sound redundant, Dr. Echo, but I, I, I think it is processed through our actions mm. that we manifest to the world that we are submitting to God by the way we act and our willingness to even suffer. Mm in relationship to that right action. Um, I, I, I don't recall the, the Supreme Court case uh, directly off the top of my head, but uh, I remember one of the justices writing an opinion and making a distinction between convictions and beliefs mm. and, and the role of the court to protect those convictions and in this sense beliefs as they manifest themselves in the actions of individuals who evidence their commitment to them mm -hmm. by uh, their willingness to suffer mm -hmm. uh, and live them out in light of their actions. Mm -hmm. So I think actions say a whole lot uh, about you know what is really churning intellectually in our heads uh, as it relates to our submission. Mm. to our, our world view. You know, this is really fascinating because actually when we talk about what goes on inside of us, the things we can't see, uh, people talk about how actions do indeed develop that interiority. They develop our choices because if we act a certain way, then the development of the interior person is simply going along for the ride, as it were. Sure. I, I, I think when you, when you think of the word love, and we hear it you know, bantered about yes. uh, in, in, in our, our living. Uh, you know, someone says, I love you, but what are people looking for mm -hmm. uh, as an evidence of a manifestation of this idea or these emotions that are churning around uh, in our heads? They're looking for actions that are consistent with an understanding of what love is lived out in the life mm. of that individual. So I, I think, again, our actions are a powerful evidence of what we genuinely believe. Mm. And, and, and I think this is where, to some extent, uh, the millennial uh, has gotten it right. Uh, uh, they want to know how uh, do our belief systems manifest themselves in the way we act. Yes. So millennials are looking for action. Uh, I think sometimes long before they're even looking for 
right belief. They want to see right belief manifested in actions. Mm -hmm. And then I think you can get begin to talk to them about right belief. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, action is just so critical. So sometimes, basically, uh, we do this backwards then. W what we do in our preaching is we tend to do a propositional approach. Absolutely. Here are these points, this is what you should be doing, when indeed what we ought to be doing is giving examples of a life lived, telling stories of a life lived, showing people who have lived a life in a certain way so that we can then say, okay, where does that come from? I, I think you've hit the nail on the, the head, and I, and I think what you've just said is very critical to let's say uh, apologetics in the uh, inner city or even uh, within the African-American community. I think white evangelicals more time than not want to process the, uh, the uh, epistemological side yes, of here the we argument, go. right thinking. Yeah, that means knowledge, by the way. Epistemology yeah. is knowledge. Go ahead. But when you go into the inner city, they want to talk about right doing. Ooh. And, and so... I think this is one of the reasons why something like Black Lives Matter can get so much traction, even though from a, a, a knowledge piece, mm -hmm. it could be disconnected from the facts. Yes. But if it can draw on the emotive piece right. within the black community, uh, you know, as we consistently think about discrimination or racism or segregation, and so we're processing a lot of things from... Uh, from the, the, the uh, affective dynamic. How are we acting? How are we acting? And so I, I think if we miss this connect, uh, you know, uh, uh, connecting that right belief to right action in urban centers or, or in uh, some uh, corners of the African American community, we see this disconnection mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in our attempt to communicate with one another. Uh, so again, uh, just elevating that, that principle of right action. So you mentioned just a moment ago the issue of emotion and how emotion really drives people toward action. And of course then certain actions are going to prompt certain kinds of emotions. Action, so absolutely. does this, so here's a different kind of question. Does the, does the audience to whom we are speaking matter when we talk about worldview, if we're given, if we know that there's a certain audience that responds to action, another audience responds to emotion, does that teach us then that our approach or our presentations must differ? I think they do, uh, but I, I think also we, we, we've got to see if, if we can think through a way to bring these two communities together, but I think, uh, it, you know, if we're going to talk to a predominantly um, middle class uh, African American community and we want to talk about a, a biblical worldview, I think we need to approach it from right acts. Okay. If you talked about, you know, the preacher who, who might be expounding uh, intellectually on, on, on these ideas, uh, he may be missing the audience if, uh, if he's talking to the wrong audience, if the audience he's engaging wants to or processes information through the emotions or through the actions, then there's a sense in which he's talking over them. And, um, and so, of course, the opposite would be true, I believe, if he's engaging a predominantly middle class, uh, you know, white American uh, community uh, that talking purely from an emotive viewpoint uh, may be missing that audience because they're looking for that epistemological mm -hmm. connection uh, and, and, and so we must definitely, as you've, you've uh, recommended, we must definitely take our audience into mm -hmm. consideration. Yeah, the, the presentation of how we communicate truth is always going to not, not simply matter about the content, but it's got to be woven with proper communication as well. So uh, here, here's another question. Uh, can you give us some examples of how a Christian worldview specifically impacts what you are teaching? Well, one of the things I, I, I strive to do is to connect, uh, and I know this is going to sound redundant, is, is uh, when I'm teaching is to connect the students to the idea of here a right thought and right action how right thought can or should lead 
to right action. And I try to consistently convey to my students that you need to be doing, you need to be doing, you need to be thinking and doing. Right thinking, right doing. And um, I try to consistently drill that into their heads so that it isn't just an, uh, an intellectual engagement. No, that's huge because we, we can't simply just do one thing. So what are a few key differences, would you say, between the Christian view of life and those who have other viewpoints? I think the Christian view of life is a, a holistic view mm. of life, and it helps us process the world the way it really is. And I believe that that is something that uh, any other world view you put on the table uh, and sift uh, through, um, you know, here's, here's a lens that uh, Dr. Ro uh, Robbie Zacharias gave okay. us. And I think if you sift any world view through this lens, you're going to find them consistently failing in the majority uh, of, of these, uh, these world view tests uh, and thus failing. Uh, one of the things that we understand about the Christian worldview is that it is uh, coherent. It is internally consistent. Mm. Uh, another aspect of the Christian worldview is that it corresponds to reality. Uh, we understand that the Christian worldview has explanatory power. It explains the world the way it really is. It mm. also avoids extremes. Um, uh, the Christian worldview has lines of evidence, and so uh, it has an accumulative, it's a, accumulating uh, evidences uh, to um, uh, provide a solid foundation for what it's affirming. And then the Christian worldview refutes uh, either implicitly or explicitly those worldviews that deny its affirmations about reality. And, and of course, we should expect this in light of the fact that the Christian worldview comes from the creator of the world. Mm -hmm. So we should expect it to correspond with the world in all of these ways. And so when we put other worldviews to the test, uh, if we force them through this exact same sieve, we find that they do not, uh, they do not pass the test. Uh, if, if you're a humanist and your, your worldview is based on a philo philosophical naturalism undergirded by some evolutionary worldview, uh, you have to strain the evidence in order to make it fit mm. reality. Mm -hmm. um, we don't see uh, inanimate objects giving life. We don't see that. We don't see macro, or I'm sorry, micro changes that lead to macro changes mm -hmm. in relationship to biology. So we're straining reality. We don't see that coherence or that correspondence or that explanatory power uh, in, in, in these worldviews. Or if you look at Hindu Hinduism, which tells us reality is an illusion, uh, again, uh, it just doesn't correspond with the way the world is. Mm -hmm. And so worldview after worldview after worldview uh, stacked beside the Christian worldview finds itself wanting, wanting, wanting. And, and so what those individuals, um, what they have to do in order to make their worldview uh, uh, pliable uh, is uh, they have to bend it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in fact, uh, they have to redefine reality. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to convince us that the real world isn't real in order to apply uh, their worldview. But the, the Christian worldview says, come see the world the way it is. Mm -hmm. Come understand the, where, the world the way it is. Investigate the world and, and, and see if it doesn't correspond to, uh, uh, to what the Bible has affirmed is consistent with reality. I think in that sense, the Christian worldview is quantum leaps ahead of any other worldview that challenges it by way of explaining uh, the way the world really is. Mm. I love this emphasis on the reality of, of what the world really is. And, you know, the, the Christian view of life and things 
actually acknowledges not simply the reality but the super reality that there is another world to which we must give an account so that the natural always is going to come from the supernatural and Absolutely. not the other way around Absolutely. so let's take this let's twist this a little bit and ask a different kind of question because i i know what you're going to say already <laughs> do uh, do we uh we, we understand that some people want to strain to make their re- the reality of life fit into the kind of view, the point that they have. What about the people who take the Christian worldview and assume it to be true? Let's take right and wrong, for instance. Assuming right and wrong without a basis for it. So there are people who, let's say, for instance, at Harvard Business School, sure. who have an ethics class, and they uh, assume ethics but from a human-centered point of view, have absolutely no basis for it. Do you find that? Uh, do you see that kind of working itself through life in other, in other ways, in other avenues? Absolutely. And, you, you know, one of the things uh, that these individuals have to do, whether they admit it or not, uh, they must borrow. And, and again, they may not admit this, but they must borrow from other world views specifically from the Christian world view because our understanding of right and wrong is tied into the very nature and character of God not uh, the best thinking of man over the ages uh, and, and and so yes I see it uh, I, I see it not only in humanistic endeavors but um, you look at uh, again say uh, some forms of, of Hinduism um, they, they might talk about living a life of good works, but they also talk about the golden chain of karma mm-hmm. so that even your good works come back to haunt you mm-hmm. in your reincarnation. But only the Christian worldview not only gives us an objective right and wrong, but it objectively tells us what God is doing in the world through his people to address those objective mm-hmm. rights and wrongs. Mm-hmm. So the... Uh, But again, getting back to your question originally, yes, the Harvard professor must borrow from a different world view than his own. He must adopt principles that are wholly antithetical to his world view. Because we remember in the Darwinian community, they say nature is red in tooth and claw. (laughs) Nature is vicious. There is no right, wrong, good or bad in nature. And, and so they have no objective basis for saying you ought not steal, mm. uh, you ought not embezzle, mm. you ought not defraud, mm. uh, but they must then turn around and borrow from a very different worldview, uh, even though they pretend that their worldview can produce these kinds of yes. ethics. I, I, have to see, uh, I have to say, uh, Hosea, that, that you're being very generous to people by using the word borrow. I use the word steal. <laughs> people are stealing our yeah. stuff all the time, man. And they can't have a Christian view of life and things, uh, so they're going to have to steal the right and wrong issue. Well, you know, all of this really leads us to in so many different directions that we could go. Uh, let's take a different uh, approach here and ask uh, you just to tell us a story or two about students who have successfully applied a Christian view of life and things. Uh, give us some specifics and personal uh, ideas here. Let me give you a story of how uh, this biblical worldview works its way out uh, when it's rightly applied. Uh, I had uh, a student, uh, he was married. Uh, living with his uh, in-laws. Uh, uh, this student and his wife, you know, they're, they're striving to be very godly young men and women. But they're living in an environment that is wholly antithetical to the direction God is calling him. Uh, his mother-in-law, father-in-law, very oppressive, very demeaning to them. And again, they're living with their in-laws. Mm. Uh, neither one works, neither one has a job. And as you and I know, so many students in, 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 in college who are uh, to some extent striving to live off of uh, the excess money of their student loans. And so they're having some input in the home, but they are third class citizens mm. in the home. So not only do they find themselves being abused um, 
this this young student of being abused by his mother-in-law, father-in-law, and even his wife is taking some abuse in relationship to her parents. But uh, they also have a sister living in the home who is uh, just living a, a rather debauched lifestyle. Mm. So you've got these two individuals trying to live very godly before uh, you know their in-laws or their parents. You've got a sister also living in the house who is uh, living a very debauched lifestyle. Uh, unfortunately, the home that they're living in is only a two-bedroom mm. house. Oh, my. So you've got four people oh my. living in a two-bedroom apartment. And so you've got this friction. You've got one, uh, you know, the older daughter sleeping on the couch. And, mm -hmm. and, and this, this is going on for years, right? Yes. So this abuse is, is uh, ratcheting up year after year after year till it gets to the point that uh, physical violence mm. becomes a very real um, uh, outcome mm. uh, in this relationship. But all the while... Uh, this young man and woman uh, are um, are living godly hmm. before their mother, you know, before her mother and father, before his mother-in-law and father-in-law. Uh, they're trying to process what's going on from a Christian worldview. They're trying to engage uh, the parents in the home from a Christian worldview. They're trying to honor them, honor your mother and your father, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, from this Christian worldview view and they were in this environment for about four years uh, and, and, and on one occasion came to me and um, asked me if I could help them find shelter this is how bad it was getting can you help us find shelter you know in, in a um, in a different environment but through it all they continued to live and and they didn't, uh, I, I was by God's grace able to find them shelter. And uh, when they told the uh, mother and father that they were moving out, oddly enough, God began to work in that environment at that point, uh, and they decided not to, um, uh, you know, take the shelter. Mm. But things began to change as um, uh, the light of Christ began to manifest itself in that home, uh, now I, I have no idea whether or not the parents uh, developed a relationship with Christ as Savior or even the sister, but as I continue to engage these students, they did talk about the change that took place in that household. Mm. Uh, and uh, eventually those students did move out, but I think they were a perfect example of how a life lived out in Christ even though it uh, encompasses a life of suffering and that God can help us work through suffering if we or when we consistently apply mm. this biblical worldview. So it works uh, for the pragmatist, mm -hmm. even for the pragmatist, mm. the Christian worldview works. And so that's one of the examples I have mm. of, of two young people in their, um, in their early 20s. Okay. Uh, working and walking through this uh, tumultuous experience. The, the power of the gospel, the power of a changed life, a regenerative life, uh, is really the only way that uh, that kind of outcome could come to be. Uh, you know, if you're living in a home of constant abuse, something is going to break down. Sure. But when the power comes from outside of us or inside sure. of us, as it were, uh, that's going to be totally different, a uh, totally different perspective. Well, we just have uh, a minute or two left here, so uh, let me just ask, generally speaking, uh, do you have any last thoughts or ideas that you'd like to leave with our audience today? Well, I, I would encourage them to um, connect, whether you do it through reading blogs or reading books of, of godly men and women who have uh, consistently uh, strive to live out a Christian worldview. And, and I, I have uh, uh, four individuals that come to mind, and I would encourage them to, to look these individuals up uh, and begin to pattern their lives after them. And I, I'll not go through any uh, biography because you can get that, uh, you know, as you do. Sure, your, just your, mention your the names. Internet. Absolutely. Um, 
searches. Uh, but uh, Dr. Carl Ellis. Dr. Carl Ellis? Carl That's a great point. Ellis does a lot of work in um, the black community. Uh, Dr. Ravi Zacharias. Ravi Zacharias. Probably a, the premier apologist of our day. Uh, of course, you're also going to be familiar with Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard. Uh, who has gone mm -hmm. home to be with the Lord, but mm -hmm. a very uh, influential individual. And another, another gentleman you might know uh, rather well, and, and that's Dr. Mark Echo. Oh, my oh, word. These, oh, my word. These are four individuals, <laughs> uh, three of them that I've met. I've met Dr. Ellis and Zacharias and Dr. Echo. I, I never met <laughs> Dallas Willard. Uh, but these are four individuals that have had a tremendous impact on my mm. life, and I would proffer them uh, to your audience. Thank you so much, brother. I'm <laughs> grateful for your good words today. And uh, we're going to have you back, Hosea, because uh, we want to make sure to highlight some of the good work that you're doing in apologetics through other conferences with other groups. Uh, but that's all for us today. We're grateful for you joining us today on RadioNext.tv at the Cool Groove site. This is Warp and Woof Radio. We are here every Wednesday, 10 to 12 noon. And we'll look forward to seeing you again next week.